Our message today is a mother's wish. Moms have lots of desires, lots of ambition, uh, lots of things they would like to see their children do or accomplish, but a real bizarre story back from the 90s was a mom called, uh, her name was Amanda Holloway. Amanda wanted her daughter to succeed and to become you know, the cheerleader at their Texas high school, but the trouble was there was another gal who was better than her daughter. And sure enough, when the competitions were there, when the tryouts and so forth, it was always this other girl who was getting the top spot, and that just drove uh, Wanda crazy. And so she hatched a plot. And her plot was actually to knock off. She hired a hitman to knock off the rival. And like I said, it's just, you know, something must have snapped inside of her. You know, what mom would do that? But it's just kind of, you know, a crazy story of a mom's desire gone wild, gone bad. When we look at our passage today, we'll meet a biblical mom who also desired something for her son. She wanted the best for them. And so we're going to look together at Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. There we find that the mother of Zebedee's sons, that was James and John, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. Now, that's wonderful. She's kneeling down. She's showing lots of respect. She has a, has a favor to ask of him. But then Jesus says, well, what is it that you want? And it seems like it's one of those deals where someone comes up to you and says, would you do me a favor? And they want you to say, why? Uh, Sure. But you haven't even heard what the request was yet. You know, when someone says, will you do me a favor? I always ask, well, what is it? (laughs) First, I want to know what it is I'm being asked to do before I say yes. So she comes up and says, Jesus, Jesus, you know, would you do a favor for me? And Jesus says, what is it that you want, he asked. Well, she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. These are the two positions of prominence in the ancient world. To sit at the right, to sit at the left, means that you've got the top spots. And Jesus had just talked about a chapter earlier about how all the disciples would rule with him, and mom probably heard about that, or maybe James and John informed her, and she thought, well, let's just see once if we can get the top places. And so she comes to Jesus with this request. When do our desires for the best for our children take a wrong turn? I mean, it's not wrong to have desires, to, to, to want your children to succeed, to, to see them do their best, but sometimes it just turns south. And oftentimes these things get associated with it. Pride, desire for power, ambition or wealth, which in and of themselves, not wrong, but when coupled with pride, coupled with power, all of a sudden become ugly things. And quite honestly, sometimes parents are capable of wanting things for their children that are really not healthy, really not good, because it's born out of a sense of pride and wanting to be top dog and pushing others aside. Other parents have a problem that they never really know how to let go of their children. Uh, There was a a term that was coined some years back called helicopter moms, and it was just a couple of years ago on the news that a family actually decided to move to the town where their daughter was going to go to school so that they could stay close and help their daughter in school. It's just like, you're not allowing the kid to grow up. I mean, I'm assuming that that's the daughter there, and the face is like, oh, I can't believe this is happening, you know? 
But again, the, the healthy desire to see your children do well and to provide for their needs kind of like takes a wrong turn south when it just, like, you don't let them grow up. You don't let them have responsibility or grow in maturity or allow them to make mistakes. What are the things that moms and dads, as parents, what is it that we're really looking for? What are we called upon to do as parents for our children? I came up with my own list. You probably might have other words that you would put in there, but it, it, it kind of centers around this First of all, giving them unconditional love. Every child needs this, this sense that they are loved for who they are, not for what they do, their performance, but just simply, you're my child. I love you. That is so foundational. But then on top of that, they need to learn responsibility and, and respect, to have good character, discipline in their lives, to want them to do their best, but not expecting that they will be the best or number one at all times. No, we want you to do your best, to grow up, to have maturity, to, to have some perseverance, to stick with it, to hang in there, even in the difficult times, to have an attitude that reflects more humility, even though there is a healthy sense of pride in your work, to have kindness, but then also to, to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as yourselves. That kind of pulls everything together. These are the things that parents should desire for their children. And, and Jesus, well, he's got to take a little time, not only to, to, to correct mom, but also he talks directly to those two disciples, James and John. He says to them, you don't know what you are asking. And, and uh, because it, the passage starts out saying, well, the mother of Zebedee's sons comes to Jesus, and then Jesus says, well, you don't know what you're asking. In English, it looks to us like he's still talking to mom. But in the Greek language, that you there is plural. You, both of you, because when he says to them, uh, you don't know what you're asking, and then he says, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And the answer comes from the brothers. We can, they answered. Now, this cup that Jesus is asking them to drink, what, what in the world is that? Is this some sort of initiation, right? Some sort of really toxic, you know, stuff that you're supposed to drink to prove you're a man or something like that? Now, a, a cup to drink in biblical language means, will you fulfill your destiny? Will you fulfill uh, the, the life path that God has set out for you? And sometimes that may be a, a very blessed thing. David says in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And his cup was, was a cup of blessing. He became a great king of Israel. But for Jesus, and in this context, Jesus' cup was a cup of suffering. His whole life was aimed directly at a cross. And for his followers, he warned them, if you follow me, you also will be asked to sacrifice, to take up your cross, to, to go through this time of suffering. And so he says to these brothers, listen, you're kind of angling here for the top spots in the kingdom, but are you also willing to suffer? Now they come back and say, we can. We can drink this cup. We, we are willing to suffer. And so Jesus replies to them and he says, you will indeed drink from my cup. James actually became one of the earliest martyrs following Stephen. His life was given, was taken, um, I think, by Herod. John lived, uh, as far as we know, to, to an old age, but he lived during the time of severe persecution uh, of Domitian. We looked at that when we looked at the book of Revelation. These were the times that John lived through, and we don't know for sure what his ultimate uh, uh, death involved, but he lived through some very, very difficult times as well. So Jesus said, indeed, you will drink from my cup, but guys, 
to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Jesus says, it's not my call. And I'm not going to use my place before my Father to try to get you places of high honor. That's not a road I'm going to go down. And in fact, in that same chapter, Matthew 20, a little uh, a principle of biblical interpretation here is, especially in the Gospels, when you have a story and say, wow, what's going on in this story? Look at the stories that are surrounding it. Look at the, the other passages that are nearby because oftentimes they are commenting on and interpreting one another. And we see in the first part of Matthew 20, there's the parable of the workers. A guy goes out, he hires some guys who, who didn't have any work. And he says, will you work in my vineyard? Sure, man, we will. So they work hard all day. He goes out later in the day, hires some more. Goes out later, hires some more. Almost quit in time, and he's still hiring workers. And they all work. But when quitting time comes, he pays all of them the same. Well, the guys who only worked a couple hours are going, whoa, yes, this is awesome. And the guys who worked all day are like, you know, man, they're thinking they're going to get, you know, you know, five times as much as the other guys, but they get the same amount as well. And the point of the story is, is that everyone was given the gift of grace they all were given a job when they didn't have a job. They all were given a, a day's wage, income, enough for the day. And so everyone received the same gift, though some had to work harder for it than others. But it all was a gift. The owner had the right to be generous with those who only worked a couple hours and generous with those who worked a long time. And the principle is, is that in God's kingdom... We all are what we are by a gift of grace. It's only through Jesus Christ. And some may have, you know, worked hard and, and called to suffer a lot in the kingdom, and some maybe less, but still we're all in because of grace. And so the principle that Jesus is teaching here is saying, remember the riches of grace. Whether you get the spot on the right hand or the left or any other spot, even if you're, you know, just, just make it in the door, it's all by grace. We need to keep that in mind. And then the story right before this one, Jesus has, uh, just calls people aside and he tells them, listen, the Son of Man is going to suffer and die. He's going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, he's going to be arrested, uh, flogged put up to die. And again, the message is, is that there is power in sacrifice. That Jesus, he is on his road to, uh, to Jerusalem. He is there and people are going to say, oh, King Jesus, come, you know, uh, drive out the Romans, make Israel great again and all these types of things. And Jesus is like, it's not what you think it is. It's not about, you know, taking the top spot and, and exerting your authority and power and, and control and military might. Power comes through service. Power comes through sacrifice. And Jesus begins to teach these brothers, mom, and the whole group the importance about remembering the riches of grace and the power of sacrifice. And so on this Mother's Day, we ask, is, is this what you're teaching your children? See, they're not going to learn it in this world. They're not going to learn it, you know, in, in, in normal society or whatever, because society is all about gimme, gimme, gimme. I want more, more, more power. I want to exert authority. I want to be top dog. But in Jesus' kingdom, it's just reversed. It's upside down. Are you teaching them about grace? About this free gift that we've received from Jesus Christ? And then about the power of sacrifice, being a servant, not trying to push yourself forward all the time, but instead looking to see what needs doing and being willing to do it quietly. Because Jesus goes on to teach about what is the true path to greatness 
in his kingdom. You see, after uh, Mrs. Zebedee has, has kind of interceded for her sons and the sons are saying, yeah, we can do it. Well, the other 10 guys are kind of indignant with the two brothers. And my hunch is, is that it's not because you guys so don't understand the nature of sacrifice. And so it's like, why didn't we think of that? Well, you know, they got in there first and they're asking, you know, and they're kind of mad because, you know, James and John got to Jesus first. But Jesus sees all this going on and it's like he calls a timeout. He calls all of them together and he says, listen, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and that their high officials exercise authority over them. And if you read back into history on what really drove the Roman Empire and how their society was structured, it was all about power and privilege. Jesus is right on target from what we know through history about how the world worked. It's all about lording over and then exercising authority, having your privileges and having others who suffer because you get what you want. But he says, this isn't the way it's going to be for you. Indeed, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus demonstrated that consistently through his lifetime, even up to the point of the night before his death, when none of the disciples were, you know, wanted to take the, the, the menial role of washing someone's feet. Well, that was for the lowest of the servants, but Jesus gets up puts a towel around his waist, grabs a basin with water, and begins to wash his followers' feet. And he demonstrates that attitude all the way to the cross. Jesus didn't rebuke Mrs. Zebedee. He didn't, you know, say to James and John, you are so out of line here but he wanted to give them a different picture. He wanted to remind them of all the things that he had been teaching them. And he wanted to set their sights and redirect their wishes and their desires for alignment with his kingdom. Now, as I was studying this passage this week, I came across some interesting side notes about this Mrs. Zebedee. If you look at uh, our passage and then several others, not only in Matthew, but Mark, Luke, and John, and you begin to see how this lady is described, you know, Mrs. Zebedee, the sons of, you know, of Zebedee, um, and then she is also one um, that when you make the connections, we realize from, from uh, actually the Gospel of John that she was a sister to Mary, Jesus' mother. I didn't realize that before this week. And so here she does have this close family connection going on. Another thing is that she was a follower and supporter of Jesus. She's identified as one of the women who uh, walked with him and uh, provided um, for him through their own uh, resources and so forth. And so they were kind of the support network uh, for Jesus and the disciples. An additional thing, she was present at his crucifixion. And she was at Jesus' tomb on Easter morning, the morning of the resurrection. She's identified there. Her name, we learn from the other Gospels, was Salome. And if you see in the first part of that name, Salam or Shalom in Hebrew, which means peace. Her name means my peace. And I want to draw some connections now between this mom and us and some of the prayers for a mother. What is your prayer for your children? First of all, to be a follower of Jesus, 
Salome was a follower of Jesus. Her desire at that point had taken a wrong turn, but her heart was in the right place. She followed Jesus, and she supported his ministry. Are we teaching our children to be followers of Jesus, to know him, to love him, to, to, to give of our support to him, and to pattern our lives after him? The second, to kneel before his cross and to receive grace. Mrs. Zebedee, Salome, was at the cross of Jesus. When many had fled and left because they feared for their own lives, she was there, along with Mary and John and just a handful of others. She was there at the cross of Jesus, kneeling before him. Do we teach our children to kneel at the cross of Jesus? To not be afraid what others are thinking, not be afraid if we, they kind of get mocked or, or, or picked on because they're Christian, but to have devotion to Jesus that would go all the way to a cross. To kneel there at the cross knowing that that is the only place where we're going to receive mercy and grace. And then to know the power of his resurrection. There she was with Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and they went to the tomb, and there was this great earthquake, and the angel rolls back the stone, and they're just you know, looking at all of this, and they're terrified at what's going on. But then the message comes, Jesus is not here. He has risen just as he said, now go and tell the disciples what you've seen and heard. And those ladies ran back to town and they, they ran back to the room where the disciples were and shared the good news. The power of the resurrection was first revealed to them. And they wanted to share that with others because it was life transforming. Mom, do you first of all know the power of Jesus' resurrection in your life? And are you teaching your children? about who Jesus is and what he's accomplished and that he now reigns in heaven with the Father and is preparing a place for us there to know the power of his resurrection and, but then to be a servant because Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, this is what it looks like. Be a servant. Give your best to him. And then finally with her name, Salome, to have peace in Jesus Christ, to know that peace that is beyond understanding. You see, so much of when our pride and our desire for power, our, our ambition or wealth gets, gets skewed and wrapped up is that we don't have peace in who we are in Jesus. That we're trying to grab this, these positions of prominence so that you know, we feel like our lives will be better and better and that others will look up to us and that finally we'll be happy. But happiness is not found in these things. It's only found in Jesus, our peace. And when we know that peace, when we see Jesus for who he is, and our lives are just overwhelmed by his, we come to this place of contentment and joy that we can live out of, and others will see that in us as well. See that we have a peace about us that is just beyond, and they'll be drawn to that as well. What a beautiful thing for our children to have. The peace of Jesus Christ and that attractiveness that others will see. And though kids may still get a little mocked and ridiculed at school and so forth, there'll be something very attractive about them as well. That they'll be the student that others turn to when they need help, when they need peace, when, when things are going wrong. They will naturally be drawn to those who know Jesus Christ. And there is the place where the good news can be shared. So what's your wish? What's your desire for your children? We have lots of things that we put time and attention to. 
But moms, dads, can we lead our children to Jesus? And through the scriptures and through Jesus living through us that our children will just stand overwhelmed, in awe of a God and Savior who gave his all for us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we look to you and we admit that sometimes our wishes, our desires, our ambitions go in a wrong direction. That for Salome and her sons, they were looking for something that maybe they shouldn't have been pursuing. But you show us the way, Lord. You exemplified that in your own life, the way of service, the way of sacrifice, the gift of grace from the Father that only comes through you. Help us, Lord, to not only embrace that ourselves, but to pass that along to our children as well so that they can be people of peace and agents of peace in this broken and hurting world. In your name we pray. Amen.